So this story begins the section in the Synoptic Gospels that we call the Little Apocalypse. Maybe you can see why. Jesus starts talking about wars and rumors of wars, of nation rising against nation and the temple itself being thrown down. In the verses to follow, he'll talk about, uh, he'll foretell the persecution of his disciples and the arrival of false messiahs and the signs and portents that will accompany his own return. Omens such as the sun being darkened and the falling of the stars from the sky. Seems pretty apocalyptic, doesn't it? In English, the word apocalypse has come to refer to the end of the world. It's something we fear and hate and wish to avoid. The word has become a threat, a byword, a warning of the consequences of our careless or sinful actions. And that's why it's always a little jarring when we hear things like we read today, when Jesus says, do not be alarmed. Or when Daniel talks about the deliverance that comes along with this time of unprecedented anguish. Or when the author to the letter of the Hebrews speaks with hope of the approaching day. In reality, the Greek word apocalypsis just means revealing, like a shining of a light in a dark room or the pulling back of a curtain. It might seem a little funny that such a benign word could conjure the death and destruction that it brings to mind for us, but that's not by accident. One of the central theses of apocalyptic literature, books like Daniel or Revelation, or like the section of the Gospels that we're reading from now, is that the way the world is and all the assumptions that we take for granted are illusions. Behind those illusions lies a hidden reality, a true reality that will be revealed. It seems now like injustice and oppression go unchecked, but the hidden reality is that God is actually in control that these things will have an end. For example, it's an illusion that money makes the world go round or that might makes right. For better or for worse, those are the rules of the game, the way that things work. We order our lives around those things, but when those illusions are stripped away, everything built on them will fall apart, like the rug being pulled out from under a stack of blocks. Apocalyptic theology actually looks forward to this revealing as the coming of God's kingdom, the fulfillment of God's promise and the inauguration of the reign of justice and peace, the revealing of that which is hidden. But in order for that kingdom to come, all the old kingdoms have to first pass away. They'll be so thoroughly wiped out that not one stone will be left on another in order to make room for what is to come. Even the physical edifices of heaven and earth themselves are depicted as being shaken by this upheaval to give us a sense of just how drastic this change will be. The earth itself trembles and the stars fall from the sky. And this is why apocalyptic literature paradoxically invites the reader to have hope and courage to actually look forward to these terrible things like wars and rumors of wars, because those things are signs that the old oppressive and destructive order is crumbling under its own weight. That that is making room for the new peaceful order that God is establishing. Far from intending to frighten or confuse, Apocalypse is written to inspire hope and instill confidence that no matter what things may seem like now, God's vision will triumph in the end. So consider this. According to the best of our information, St. Mark wrote his gospel sometime around 70 CE. In 66, the Judeans had revolted against Rome. And in 70, the temple in Jerusalem, that big building made of big stones, that same one the disciple was gawking at in the story, that temple was destroyed, thrown down. So the people to whom St. Mark is writing, 
For them, this isn't a uh, vague description of some future catastrophe. It's a description of what they've just experienced. It's nation rising against nation, wars and rumors of wars, and the total destruction of the temple. In the midst of all of this, they hear Jesus saying to them, Do not be alarmed. These are but the beginnings of the birth pangs. When everything else seems to be falling apart, it's reassuring to be told that they are falling apart so that the next thing can be put together from the pieces. For this and for many other reasons, Christians in the first couple of centuries after Jesus believed that his return was imminent, that he could come back any moment now. They lived in the full expectation that the next Roman conquest or the next earthquake or the next famine could be the one that Jesus was talking about. After 2,000 years of waiting, we've kind of lost that sense of imminence. And for that reason, we sometimes think those first Christians a little naive. Our faith has given us a much longer view of things. And yet, here we are, living in a world that, frankly, for the entire lifetime of any of us here, has been on the brink of destruction. The First World War was so devastating that everyone called it the war to end all wars. But its single greatest legacy was causing the Second World War. Ever since the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we've lived in the shadow of that mushroom cloud. Even as the specter of nuclear winter has slowly faded, our attention has been turned to climate change and the sixth mass extinction. The how keeps changing, but the what never does. The end, the apocalypse, is always right around the corner. And that's what makes apocalyptic theology so powerful and enduring and ultimately so important and helpful. Because the fact that there's always some threat to our survival doesn't diminish these threats. It puts them in perspective. It says that as powerful as we think we are, as much as we think we are in control, we are not. We continue to exist as much by luck as by power. The end is coming, because the end is always coming. One of these days, the doomsday clock will strike midnight for one reason or another. But more than that, it isn't just that the end is always coming, it's that the end is always here. That's called progress, right? What's old is constantly passing away, eternally making way for what comes next. Just as horses gave way to uh, uh, automatic buggies and trains, and room-sized computers begat smartphones, everything is constantly changing. Not just technology, but culture, and philosophy, and art, and the human condition. The hope of apocalyptic, apocalyptic theology, the hope that we hear today, is found in resurrection the rising to new life out of death. As old attitudes die, as old perspectives and paradigms die, as old ideas about success die, new ones arise. Death may not be pleasant, but it is natural, and it is a part of God's good creation. Death is even a part of life. Or as the teacher from Ecclesiastes puts it, for everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. Even the experience of destruction carries the seeds for renewal, just as new birth foreshadows eventual death. Perhaps the most dramatic example of this is in St. Mark's story itself. You see, the temple isn't just the temple. It's not just the big building made of large stones. It's the central place of worship and the foundation of Jewish identity. Without the temple, what does it mean to be Jewish? 
When Jesus foretells its destruction, he's not talking about the Jewish revolt, or at least not just about that. He's also talking about the death of Judaism as everyone knows it. And that's exactly what happened. The entire function of the religious institution to remove the sin that separates people from God through ritual sacrifice was completely obliterated in an instant. But Judaism isn't dead, is it? Instead of laying down and dying, the Jewish people did what they have done for millennia. They adapted and endured. Judaism is alive and well today despite the destruction of the temple. It's different than it was 2,000 years ago, but that would be true regardless, right? No matter what, it would have died and been reborn. In addition, rather than losing their experience of God, Jews began to experience God in new ways through the disruption of that religious institution. There's hope for all of us in that. We may not be imminently awaiting the second coming of Jesus like those earliest Christians were, but maybe we can still read these stories hopefully, just as our ancestors did, rather than ignoring or forgetting them. Personally, I'm grateful that every year around this time we take them out and dust them off to remind ourselves that the end is real and that it is also what comes right before the beginning. It seems like there are always wars and rumors of wars, doesn't it? That somewhere there's always an earthquake or a famine or some other natural disaster happening. In that way, these words remind us that the end is always upon us. That it is constantly giving way to new beginnings. We can also look to these words for hope in the face of the big things that threaten us and our existence. Things like climate change or pandemic, or political polarization. These forces threaten to destroy our society and our social order, and even our ability to survive on this planet. And those are exactly the kinds of things that these words give us the hope to face. One way or another, everything we know will pass away. Not one stone will be left on another. This is simply a given. Maybe some of the questions this text invites us to ponder are what comes next? And what are we to do in the meantime? We could sit back and just wait for the end, right? We could resign ourselves to our fate and sing que sera, sera, and just wait for it all to be over. Or, or we could be changed by this moment. We could welcome the end of what was and step boldly into what will be. We could provoke one another to love and good deeds and encourage one another even as we say that day approaching. We could step forward with a full assurance of faith, with hearts sprinkled clean and ask God to remake us in this moment for what comes next. Even if the world were to end, Who's to say this isn't an opportunity for us to help it end with dignity and care and to set the stage for what's coming next? Even if this is the end, it's also the beginning. This little apocalypse, for example, is always the source of text for the last few Sundays after Pentecost, as well as the first Sunday in Advent, the start of our new liturgical year. The little apocalypse is our annual setting for the transition of one liturgical year into another, the end of the green ordinary season and the beginning of the blue season of Advent, the time for waiting and expectation and preparation for the coming of Christ and the new creation. So yeah, this is the end. But what is this end revealing to us? What does it help us to see? How is this end pointing us to the beginning that is at hand?